might be a day we always remember. We could always have a good day indoors. All right, let's make the best of it. Although there, it, it's always sad when people live without their heat. You have had some deaths because people don't understand or don't know how to deal with this extreme okay. weather in the South. But the kids get out of school and they love the sledding. And these are states that rarely see snow. And every now and then it's nice. There you go. Right. When you have places like Tallahassee, Florida, or Charleston, South Carolina, that are they're seeing waking it. up thinking, yeah. what is that? Is every sled still a flexible flyer, or have they got other brands? Well, they've got other brands. I don't know. I'm about to get out. to that stage. I thought about that. When right. do I start sledding with Hayden? When you get a candle and you just go on the blades. We used to just <laughs> what? take. What? Yeah, to make the wax on the blades and make the thing right. go. Oh, yeah. In nice. college, we would take uh, the cafeteria trays. Yes, we did that. And too. just go down the hill. Yeah. Well, way too fast. And anyway. Then, and then would you put them back, the trays? Then they were dead. <laughs> I don't think it is. It was college, Brian. Yeah. All right. Anyway, so thank you very much for yes. There. Thanks for joining us on this Thursday, and we start with the bulletin talking about the weather. A massive winter storm is actually hammering the East Coast as we speak, dumping snow and unleashing hurricane force winds. Those are winds above 75 miles per hour. The forecast forecast just got worse overnight for millions of people in the path of this big storm. More than 3,000 flights have been canceled or delayed nationwide, and that number is expected to go up. The Charleston International Airport in South Carolina shut down. Inches of snow and ice covered the runways. Look at that. Ice. Wow, and it's always about Ainsley State. More than <laughs> 25,000 people living near the Virginia coast. No power. The National Guard there and ready to help. Over a dozen states now under a blizzard warning, including Florida for the first time in 35 years getting snow. Janice Dean is live on the plaza where the focus for the first time in a long time is not the New York Giants. It's about the New York weather. <laughs> this is our Super Bowl. It might not be their Super Bowl, unfortunately, but go Giants. All right, so the snow has started here in New York City. Yes, the snow totals have gone up, but we said that yesterday, that if the storm moved a little bit more to the west, we would be dealing with higher snowfall totals, and that's exactly what happened overnight. So 48 inches here in the city, but Long Island, parts of Long Island, eastern Long Island could get upwards of 18 inches. Boston, up towards Boston and New England, and then, of course, the winds. This storm system is very strong, very large wind field, already 49 mile per hour winds in Ocean City, Maryland, 36 in Atlantic City. This storm hasn't even gotten its act together, and we're already seeing uh, at least tropical storm force winds. As you mentioned, blizzard warnings have been posted anywhere from coastal North Carolina up towards the Delmarva, parts of New Jersey, Long Island, up towards Boston and Maryland. Maine. So blizzard warning, meaning that conditions are deteriorating. We're going to see visibility less than a quarter of a mile and wind gusts in excess of 35 miles per hour for the duration of at least three hours. This storm is going to be with us throughout the day today. So that's why non-essential workers need to stay home. People need to stay off the roads. Uh, we're going to see a lot of snow and a lot of wind really for the next 6 to 12 to 18 hours. And even when the storm is done, we're still going to be dealing with the potential for very strong winds. So you Look at these snow totals really up the forecast here, especially for places like Atlantic City, Long Island. I think Boston could see upwards of a foot or more. Same with eastern Long Island and New York. We're, we're looking at four to eight inches. Uh, but I also want to make mention, guys, that once this storm is over, temperatures are going to drop like a rock. And as we head into the weekend, say New York City, minus one as the low. So if you're without power along the coast with hurricane force winds, that's very possible. You need know, to know what to do to get warm because we're going to be dealing with extreme cold as we headed the weekend. Back to you. Indeed. Wow. Like we started this program today, not the best day of the year weather-wise. Janice, thank you very much. You got it. Live thank reports you, throughout the morning. Well, the country is talking about uh, the first story from really inside the White House, first 200-plus days. That was what Michael Wolff's uh, mission was. Michael Wolff, uh, a reporter, uh, that he'd written a few other books out there. Uh, he, won the pres he got the president's interest originally when he came out against the New York Times, when the New York Times, in Michael Wolff's mind and, of course, President Trump's mind, was being unfair to him. He did give an interview to the president for Fire and Fury, the book, for five to seven minutes. But for the most part, he seems to have been in the White House quite often and base this new book on the inside the Trump White House called Fire and Fury on over 200 interviews. Most right. of those interviews were in and around Steve Bannon and his views of the world. Steve Bannon evidently was picking up the phone, urging people to cooperate with Michael Wolff. Well, and in that book, the left is having a heyday with us because in the book, you have Steve Bannon, who, who's there, who was fired from the White House, no longer works there with the president's administration. But in the book,
book, he was talking about that meeting that Don Jr., Jared Kushner, and Paul Manafort had with the Russians, including that Russian lawyer at Trump Tower. And Bannon, in the book, allegedly, he says that that was treasonous and it was unpatriotic. The White House reaction from Sarah Huckabee Sanders yesterday, uh, she said, called it trashy tabloid fiction filled with false and misleading accounts. She also said that the president of the United States, when he found out about it, was furious. Of course, the question is whether or not it is accurate. It's interesting, John Podhoritz, who's writing on the pages of the New York Post this morning, talks about uh, Mr. Wolf, who wrote the book, and says that he is a solid reporter, and he weaves solid reporting with errant speculation, and it's impossible to tell what's true from what's too good to be true. For instance, he does cite the time in the book where apparently at one point Donald Trump uh, didn't know reportedly who John Boehner was, which was crazy because he spoke to him and tweeted about him all the time and even played golf with him. So some are wondering whether or not a lot of these sources who have been at the White House but were axed have yeah. access to grind. These books are now circulating throughout the newsrooms because it comes out next Tuesday. And in the book, it also talks about how Melania cried, not tears of joy when he won. Talks about um, Ivanka in the book, and just is not, bad not about positive everybody. about the family, right? Yeah. So the president steamed about this. He said Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Steve was a staffer who worked for me after I had already won the nomination by defeating seven. Candidates. Steve doesn't represent my base. He's only in it for himself. Right. Burn. Uh, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, everyone was just stunned by this because uh, most people did not know what to make of Steve Bannon when he came onto the scene uh, nationally. And then they heard he was this uh, the Trump whisperer and he was really had the mindset of the president. And then he was really much marginalized in the White House and his exit was imminent for the longest time. And then they finally parted ways. But for the most part, he's been backing the president and backing loser candidates like Senator Roy Moore and led the president down a, a couple of pathways that didn't benefit the party or him. However, uh, Steve Bannon last night, after being uh, basically characterizing the president as an unserious candidate, uh, uh, engaged in this effort mainly out of his own ego, said this on his own radio show to a caller who called up about the book. The president of the United States is a great man. You know, I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country, given the Trump miracle speech or on the show or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. But I appreciate the kind words. So what explains the kind words? ABC had a news bulletin last night where they said that uh, Mr. Bannon was uh, served with papers last night from Mr. Trump's attorneys that said cease and desist. Reminded him that when he worked for the candidate and the campaign, everybody on the campaign signed a non-disclosure agreement and non uh, disparagement agreement and this would count as that and uh, they went on to say that apparently legal action is imminent. Here's Mike Huckabee, tries to put it all into perspective. Well, it's disappointing, and in part because uh, just a few days ago, Steve Bannon was considered by the press to be the unhinged, uh, he's crazy, he's a wild man. Suddenly, this guy, Michael Wolf, quotes him in a book saying terrible things about President Trump, and now he's a hero. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is this, there are two things you give to someone when you're hired in a political context. You give them loyalty, and you give them confidentiality. Those are the two virtues that are more important than anything else you can bring. There have been a number of people who came out, and they didn't go out and trash the president or the other people they worked with at the White House. Uh, I should point out, I talked to Steve Bannon last night, asked him if he would like to come on the program. He declined. Hmm. Right. Did he say anything interesting uh, to move the story forward? Off the record. Not really. Not really. Didn't confirm any of that stuff. Okay. Anyway, uh, 610 in New York City. we got lots to talk about this morning. Jillian joins us right now with headlines. Yes, Good we morning. do. Good Thursday morning to you guys, to you at home as well. Let's get you caught up on some of your headlines, starting with the bone-chilling cold and winter weather sweeping much of the nation, responsible for derailing an Amtrak train carrying 300 people overnight. A frozen switch caused three cars to slip off the tracks while pulling into a Savannah, Georgia train station. The train was able to continue on to New York City. The Coast Guard searching for a plane that mysteriously vanished over the Gulf of Mexico. The single-engine plane took off from Wiley Post Airport in Oklahoma City, bound for another small airport near Austin, but it never made it. This 
eerie flight path shows the plane heading past where it was supposed to land in Texas and straight out over the water. That's when the pilot stopped responding to air traffic control. Firefighters rushing to the home of Bill and Hillary Clinton. A small fire breaking out on the second floor of a Secret Service facility on their property in Chappaqua, New York, north of Manhattan. The structure is not attached to their house, and the Clintons were not home at the time. The cause of the fire is still unclear. No one was hurt. The Powerball jackpot surging overnight to more than half a billion dollars. No one won last night, so you still have a chance. The grand prize jumping to $550 million the eighth largest lottery prize ever. The next drawing is Saturday. The $418 million Mega Millions drawing is tomorrow. Combined, the jackpots are a record-setting $968 million. Wow. Exciting. So if you missed out on Bitcoin, you could still get rich with <laughs> there it. There you go. Yep. <laughs> All right. Julia. All right. Thanks, Julia. Uh, 12 minutes after the hour, President Trump putting North Korea on notice. But that's not okay. He is not merely being cavalier with a threat about nuclear war. He's being cavalier in a way that makes him seem demented and deranged. None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this, frankly, stable behavior. So uh, what is so wrong with standing up to a dictator all of a sudden? House Intelligence member Congressman Will Hurd live in studio or else he wouldn't be behind our set. Plus, they think violence is necessary. So why is one of the top guys at the DNC promoting the Antifa movement? That book is about it. We're going to tell you his story coming up. Could you make this louder? Should Americans be concerned about the president's mental fitness that he appears to be speaking so lightly about threats regarding the nuclear button? He is not merely being cavalier with a threat about nuclear war. He's being cavalier in a way that makes him seem demented and deranged. None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this, frankly, stable behavior. Trump needs to be medicated and hospitalized <laughs> at this point, or he is going to just kill all of us. And, you know, my feeling is that probably they're getting closer to him in the Mueller investigation. And that's what this is about, a lot of it. Uh, why is she still on television? Here to react to the media outrageous GOP congressman, former CIA officer, Will Hurd. He sits on the House Intel Committee and joins us now to weigh in. The president going directly at mm -hmm. uh, the Kim Jong-un, who's clearly un unstable, and American media commentators and so-called journalists are going at our president. Is that, is that unhealthy? Look, here's one of the things I learned as an undercover officer in the CIA. I was the guy in the back alleys at 4 o'clock in the morning. Be nice with nice guys and tough with tough guys. And we have to look at what is actually happening. Um, the fact that North Korea picked up the phone and called South Korea to start a dialogue, that's a big deal. Um, that's a good thing in order to resolve this, this, this escalation of tension with diplomacy. The fact that the North Koreans are talking about joining the Olympics and participating in the Olympics is a big deal. The fact that we have China working with us on sanctions against North Korea. A year ago, nobody thought that was possible. So you may not like the tactics, but the actions and, and what it, those tactics are producing, and we got to say it's, it's been successful. When you get reports that the army, uh, army officers on the north side are allowed to leave their post to hunt for food, when we see defectors come in uh, undernourished and full of bacteria, it shows there's a suffering on the inside that might force something to happen. Look, Kim, Kim Jong-un is interested in, in one thing and one thing only, and that's staying in power, and he'll do anything to do that. He has already proven he's willing to kill his own people. He's always proven, he's already proven that he's willing to assassinate his, his own family members. He is the person that may not be fit for office. Something that's catching the Iranian government by surprise, and maybe our intelligence agencies, is this uprising in Iran. It's happening in the rural areas among young people, not in the major cities. What stands out for you, and what should the American people know about this? Well, the American people should know that this is, this is Iranian people saying they're sick and tired of their government. One of the things I wish was happening is that more folks in the media was covering the president's tweets on this topic. The fact that he's standing up with and standing side by side with the Iranian people and not the Iranian government. And what 
makes this a little bit different than 2009. It's in more places uh, in the country of Iran. It started in some of the rural areas. And what you're seeing when you're getting reports that security officials are starting to join the protesters. This is what happened in 1989 when uh, Nikolai Ceausescu was deposed in about two weeks is when the security forces start working with the people. You can see some change. Happening. And it was uh, exposure of the budget, how much money is going to terror, not to them that got these people to stand up and just want human rights and equality of life. But I think it's important that the European Union get involved. Instead, they're sitting on the sidelines. Look, I, I wish our friends in the UK, France, in Germany would follow President Trump's lead. I wish they would follow um, Vice President Pence's lead and talk about how they're standing up for uh, the Iranian people. We need to amplify the message of the Iranian people. The Iranian government is trying to crack down on the internet, trying to prevent them from getting out what's really happening in that country. And all of us out in the rest of the world, we need to be broadcasting back in what they can't broadcast themselves um, in, in Iran. That's an important, that's an right. important initiative. And that's why I'm glad that the right. HR McMasters and, and Vice President Pence went on Voice of America to tell the Iranian right. people directly. Well, ultimately, the president will be judged by results, and that's how he wants it. Congressman, thanks so much. Thank Great you. to see you. Good to see you. All right. Good luck uh, braving the weather in New York. <laughs> uh, coming up straight ahead. Speaking of the protests in Iran, women taken to the streets to fight for freedom. Tommy Laren wants to know where all the women here are in the U.S. marching for those Iranian women who just want the right to have a quality of life. Here's some quick headlines, starting with a Fox News alert. Four people are dead and dozens more are hurt after a train collides with a truck exploding into a fire in South Africa. You can see flames shooting out of the windows with thick black smoke rising into the sky. And in its quest to build up a nuclear arsenal, North Korea might have bombed itself. What? The diplomat reporting that the rogue nation test launched an intermediate range missile back in April, but it fell out of the sky, not far from the launch site. No word if anyone was killed, but it caused a lot of damage. Joy Behar, co-host of The View for now, completely unhinged, comparing President Trump to Iranian dictators. Listen to this. Uh, it's not apples and apples. It's not equal. Mm -hmm. But we're on a very slippery slope, slope in this country toward throwing democracy out the window well, every the single is, day. We have to defend the freedom of the press and civil rights here. Mm -hmm. We do, but and, we're not being you know, stoned in the, the street for being gay. Not yet. Not yet. They're completely, not yet. They're, not yet. They're, not yet. Fox News <laughs> contributor Tommy Laren here to react. She joins us right now. Uh, Tommy, uh, out in Los Angeles, so we heard uh, Meghan McCain say, uh, you're not being stoned in the street for being gay, and then Joy Behar said, no, not yet. What does that say to you? Well, I don't expect uh, anything else from this group of women. I'm happy that Meghan McCain stood up for what was right and she interjected because that can sometimes be very hard to do on a show like that. But to Meghan McCain's point, just to reiterate what she's saying, the fact that Joy Behar can sit there on that stage, on that cushy stage, and speak out against a sitting president and doesn't have to be on stage wearing a burqa, can be on camera doing what she's doing is exactly what I'm talking about. It's indicative that what she's comparing President Trump to Iranian dictators? Absolutely ludicrous, but she can't see it because Trump derangement syndrome is in full effect, and that's no more present than on The View day in and day out. Well, those, the Iranian women are fighting for their freedom. They're fighting for food, and they're fighting for freedom. And the Women's March protesters here in, in America, many conservatives are saying, where are they now? You know, they were protesting when President Trump was running. Linda Sarsour, she tweeted out this. She's calling out conservative women, saying that Muslim women executed, raped in mass in Burma, not a peep out of conservative American women. Now they are all up in arms on hashtag Iran. Selective outrage is not a good look. Now, aren't they having selective outrage, though? They're not protesting these women and how they're treated in Iran. Well, let's talk about the Women's March protesters. They were protesting against Donald Trump. They were wearing pink hats. They were saying, F Donald Trump. They were marching in the streets for free birth control. Now we've got women in Iran actually standing up for more rights, more speech, more information, for a better life. And somehow, that is not women's rights. They're not coming out in mass to support that. And also, we've got a sitting president, unlike President Obama, who is supporting the protesters in Iran. Where are the feminists out to applaud him for what he's doing? This just goes to show it's not about the actions of the president. It's not about the message of the president. It's just about being anti-Trump, no matter what he does, even if he's doing something that they should mm. fully support.
Tommy, it's just kind of amazing because their message would be so much stronger and their power so much greater if they would just do what you said because it would be impossible to marginalize them into one point of view. They'd be speaking for 50% of the world's population instead of 50% of our political process. It's nothing more than anti-Trump. Every protest we've seen in the United States of America has just been anti-Trump or anti-America. Meanwhile, in other places around the world, people mm -hmm. are rising up for more rights, more speech. And this president supports it. When the left is able to get on board with that, maybe, maybe they will see the light. But I'm not going to hold my breath. Maybe. All right. And the final thing we wanted to talk to you about, uh, Tommy, you know, the uh, uh, Philadelphia QB, uh, Carson Wentz, he was... Uh, he posted something on social media a couple of days ago uh, where he showed a picture of his dog. There's the dog. It's a puppy. Screen right. Then screen left, it shows how the dog had grown up to be a great hunting dog. And as you can see, uh, it was a successful day hunting. A number of people online found that picture on the left offensive because of the dead birds. And then he defended himself by tweeting out, appreciate that, but offensive and controversial. Two of the main things I tweet about are Jesus and hunting. That's what I'm passionate about. And that won't ever change. When you love something, you talk about it. Stay convicted, convicted about it, and don't worry what others think. What do you think? Well, good for him. It's nice to see someone in the world of sports and entertainment finally coming out and being able to stand up for themselves in a way that's very proud, very American. And let me just say, this just goes to show how the left and liberals have gone off the deep end because they are now so offended by hunting, which is an American tradition, by the way, in many parts of this country for both Democrats and Republicans. And also, need I remind them, hunting, conservation efforts, Biologists, for these leftists that love science so much, mm -hmm. biologists and conservationists encourage hunting for population control and to keep the planet and to keep animals healthy and able to sustain themselves. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where the science-loving left is on this one. Apparently, they're just too busy being offended by right. everything. I know Willie Robertson, if he's up right now, would be standing and clapping. Sure. Uh, from he Duck probably Dynasty. is right now. <laughs> Let's listen. Uh, can't hear. Can't hear. Down in Monroe. <laughs> All right, uh, Tommy, thank you very much for joining Thanks, us Tommy. on this Great busy Thursday. You. Thanks for waking up so early. California time. Yeah. All right, we've talked a lot about all these protests in the NFL. Well, the ratings are now in for the 2017 season, and they're not so good. We have details next. Plus, what do you do when you're caught red-handed and have no place to go? Uh, pray for mercy? Oh, you can't get out? Please, 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 please. I love I'm sorry, please. Please. How far do you want to go? Oh, uh, anytime you want to turn around. All right. I'm going to turn around there. Whoa! Oh, no. Oh, oh, that hurt. Wow. Uh, is that in Washington? No. Or is that in South, South Carolina. Carolina? He's trying to get to Washington. That is uh, your shot of the morning. Senator Tim Scott could not escape the South Carolina coast before the snow started, so he tried getting to Washington with alternative transportation. A boogie board, as you can see, did not end Didn't well. Didn't get too far. And I don't blame him. He grows up. He grew up in South Carolina, where there is not much snow. There is not, There's not much, much practice. Snow. If it's Boston or or, uh, or New York, you probably don't fall. In the upstate of South Carolina, they get some snow. They get a, one or two snowstorms a year in Greenville, Spartanburg, that area. But in the central part, in Columbia, the capital, or down in the coast, down in Charleston, yeah. not so much. But they're getting a lot now. You expect it in the Northeast. You don't expect it in the Mid Atlantic. Todd Pyro is live. Live right now in Islip, New York, where Todd, we're looking at your live shot. It looks like it started to come down. How windy is it? Because that's, oh, I'm looking at the light behind you. It's windy. Yeah. It is windy, Steve. Yeah, when we checked in with Fox and Friends first about an hour ago, there was no snow. We were in a little bit of a lull, but as you can tell, that has significantly changed. It is extremely snowy right now. And take a look at the road behind me. This road wasn't covered about 45 minutes ago. Now you can see we're losing blacktop by the moment. We've seen a number of plows come through, a lot of salting. Again, that's what we do here in the Northeast to prepare. But what's unique about the storm for the Northeast like you can see right there is the wind. It is extremely windy. And while we may be used to snow, it is also very cold. 
What also makes this storm extremely unique is where it hit first. Take a look. That's Florida. Florida is not used to snow, and people want to get out of the snow here in the Northeast. They typically move to Florida, as you can see. Florida got hit. And as we move up the coast, we mentioned South Carolina there. Also, Georgia. If you have any friends that live in the Georgia area, if you live your, in the Georgia area yourself, you know your state does not handle snow all that well. New York, we're pretty used to it, but again, Cold is what we're not used to. And again, this is moving up to the Boston area. They are used to this sort of thing. Again, wind is the key in this storm. It is going to be very windy, blizzard like conditions. And I want to show one other thing. Take a look. One of our great viewers pointed out that there was an American flag down behind us here. We have such patriotic viewers here. They want that fixed. So hopefully, somebody will see this live shot. Owner of the building, come on out here and fix that flag. It is not supposed to hit the ground. Thank you to uh, Pete Jones for pointing that out one of our great Fox and Friends viewers. Yeah, it looks like it's stuck in the bushes. Yeah. We've been noticing it too during your live shot. Todd, can't you just go over and uh, take it down or put it up? I'm going to try. I don't know if 100% if I know how to do that or if it's stuck, but I'm going to try my best. It would be a patriotic thing. It's not like you're yeah. actually trying to vandalize I, it. I mean, Todd, you went down a building. <laughs> you have done right, that. Right there. No, you're very, very good point. I did repel with Brian Cashman. Right. I should be able to raise a flag. No? Exactly. All right. well, while, you. while you're walking over there, don't slip an ice slip. Yeah. Uh, I won't. <laughs> uh, Special thanks to Chris Chulo for coming Had to do it. That. Had to do it. All right. Cue Thank the buzzer for Ainsley. We got to get the buzzer for that one. <laughs> All right. Everyone there we will, go. No one will forget where you are. That's All right. right. All right. All right, Todd, go <laughs> away. <laughs> Meanwhile, <laughs> he's got to fix that flag. Yeah. I think you got to take it down in yeah. bad weather like this. Meanwhile, uh, a couple hundred miles down the coast in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, is Caroline Shively. Caroline, how's the weather there? It is absolutely brutal, Steve. It started off nice and fluffy about 9 o'clock last night. Overnight, it switched to this. Take a look around. It is blustery. Goodness. Those winds are absolutely brutal, coming in at you sideways, whirling up little snow devils. We were surprised to see, can you see that truck over there? We met a guy named Tim. He is delivering frozen foods. I'm not kidding. He is delivering food this morning. Uh, he said the road's out. He came down from New York when he left no snow, and he said it just got worse and worse uh, as he got here. His beard is actually frozen. Take a look at the ground, though. The fire chief, we were talking to him. He says, this is what we want to see. If you got to have snow, this light, fluffy stuff. They were worried they were going to get some sleet, some freezing rain that would hang on those power lines. Uh, further south of us, though, there are some power outages. They're working to get those back online a couple hundred. That's going to be a problem because the wind chills get into negative four later today, guys. All right, Caroline Shively. It, and the wind is picking up. That's what they're worried about. Because Thank you, Caroline. Because uh, Janice Dean's joining us outside our world headquarters, I mm -hmm. believe. And Janice, it is the, and it's, uh, you're in the ca uh, canyon of concrete right now, so there's not a lot of wind, but that's really what this storm is all about. Right. This is a nor'easter. It is a blizzard. At least seven states under blizzard warnings, really from the Delmarva up towards Maine, uh, meaning that conditions are deteriorating now throughout the day today. We're going to see upwards of, in some cases, over a foot of snow, depending on where you live. Eastern Long Island, especially where Todd Pyro is, I think they could easily get upwards of a foot or more. And up towards Boston. Boston, you could also be in uh, the Foot Club. Let's take a look at the last 12 hours. You see the storm. It's getting cranked up. And those winds, hurricane force winds along the coast, that's the concerning part. The cold air behind this is going to be an issue, especially if people are without power. Uh, so a strengthening storm system that's going to dump a lot of snow and bring uh, windy conditions all along the coast. People are urged to stay inside. Of course, millions of kids are home from school. If you're not a non-essential worker, you really should stay home today if you live along the East Coast. Back to you. That's a good day to do that. All right, J.D., thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, it, yeah, G Jillian Mealy is also braving the weather. Here it's 68, over there it's 67. <laughs> Right. Very chilly on this side of the street. It is. Guys. I don't know how you put up with it. <laughs> I know. My goodness, these conditions. Okay, though, we do have some headlines to get to. Starting with this, the DNC deputy chair sparking outrage for seemingly showing support for the violent Antifa movement. Minnesota Congressman Keith Ellison tweeting this selfie with an Antifa handbook saying, quote, I just found the book that strikes fear in the heart of President Trump.
since the president was elected, Antifa activists have coordinated violent clashes around the country against people with far-right ideologies. Students who want to get paid to promote social justice on campus have to cough up hundreds of dollars first. In order to qualify, applicants at Oregon State University must complete a nearly $500 two-credit course. According to Campus Reform, whoever fills the part-time positions would have to work a minimum of 43 hours to pay for it. Uh, OSU responding to that claim, uh, claiming students can make a special request to take the course for free. A crook tries to pray his way to freedom from a store he robbed. Newly released surveillance video showing a worker lock the criminal inside the Houston business. He then pulls out a gun to shoot the door open. So he eventually finds the keys, but he can't use them because he damaged the lock. You know, when you try to shoot the door open, that's when he drops to his knees and starts to pray. Yeah, it didn't work. He was arrested and sent to prison. So look at your headlines, guys. I will send it back to you. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, by the way, we're getting some reports from the Robertson family. Uh, they are answering back at our, our uh, the Carson Wentz story. Yeah. So, but real quick, uh, on the NFL ratings, uh, not good news so far with pure numbers. And that's what this is about, pure numbers. CBS, Fox, NBC, ESPN, and NFL all have one thing in common. Their ratings have suffered this year. They have a season decline now of 8%. They had 8% decline in 2016 that went down again in 2017 and of course the big question is are the anthem protests that the players have uh, had on television and at the various games are they responsible for the decline in viewership so I mean there's no yes. there's no metric for that but I do know that from what we have seen and reaction we've heard a lot of people esteem that the players aren't standing for the anthem. Who well, loses the money here? The the owners and the the commissioner when the ratings are down. Everybody. And, everybody. And I mean, it's network. a business. Everything right. is a business. So they do care about this and they, they do look at these numbers. Well, they closely. pay number. They pay enormous my uh, right uh, enormous dollars for the rights fees. So they want to make sure they maximize the advertising dollars. If the ratings are down, they're not going to get them. So it was down 8% last year and 10% this year. Even if you take in the streaming, it's down. However, NBC's Sunday Night Football still number one for the seventh year in a row. ESPN's Monday Night Football dominated the key male demographics. What you're looking at is a juggernaut which is showing vulnerability for the first time in my lifetime. All I've seen my entire life was the NFL growing with no end in sight. Right. This is the biggest challenge I believe the league has ever faced. And fundamentally, I believe right. they're up for the challenge. You've got some of the smartest people there. But you know what's at the base of this? They'll get the national anthem thing straightened out. But I worry about the head injuries. And the kids are well, not that, playing. The next generation too. aren't playing. Hey, email us right now. Why do you think uh, NFL viewership is down 10%? Is it the anthem protest? Is it the fact there are so many football games on these Too days? many, yeah. Yeah, what is it? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Tweet us or Facebook. Uh, Leslie Visser, one of the finest NFL commentators, she believes it's too much football, too There's much saturation. I believe a lot of it is the flag. The Americans love the flag. They're scared of this PC culture. They love that we have so many military men and yeah. women that fight for our country. Let us know. Meanwhile, tough words for sanctuary cities from the acting ICE director. They need to file charges against the sanctuary cities. More citizens are going to die because of these policies. So should lawmakers really be charged with a crime? Mayor de Blasio, are you listening? President Trump's former campaign advisor, Michael Caputo, next on the Bannon-Trump fracture. Cease and desist. This morning, President Trump's legal team warning former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon after he blasted Don Jr.'s meeting with Russians as treasonous in this bombshell new book. The president firing back saying Steve Bannon has nothing to do with me or my presidency. When he was fired, he not only lost his job, he lost his mind. Now that he's on his own, Steve is learning that winning isn't as easy as I make it look. Steve had very little to do with our historic victory. And he went on from there. Here to weigh in is Michael Caputo. He was a former senior advisor, one of the first in on the Trump campaign back in June of 2016. He joins us right now with an inside look because, Michael, you were on the inside. First off, uh, which side are you on? Are you on the president's side or you think Steve Bannon has it right in his book uh, depicting his characterization of the president in Michael Wolf's book? 
I, I stand with the president 100%. And it had to be really disheartening and even maddening for, for the president to read those excerpts that were released yesterday. This book by Michael Wolf is is just trash, is, if you ask me. Uh, you can't really believe what Michael Wolf says uh, in any of his writings. A Columbia Journalism Review called his work twisted and disgusting. That comes from the voice of American journalism, Columbia Journalism Review. Mm. However, you know, clearly the president believes what Michael Wolf wrote about Steve Bannon and others. Um, the, the comments about, in particular, about Don Jr. in that meeting in Trump Tower right. in June of 2016, they were, you know, I thought I was really disturbed by those comments. I think that that causes grief for the president and this presidency uh, in the context of the ongoing Russia investigations. Right. And uh, I don't blame the president one bit for going off like he did. Hey, Michael, uh, reportedly, uh, this uh, Steve Bannon has.